Hi everybody, my name is Jo Bacon and today I'd like to share with you, my college peers, my insight to the covenant, the theme covenant. Now, when we look at Richard Booker, he's the author of The Miracle of the Scarlet Thread. He says that covenant is now. In the Bible, the word covenant means a binding agreement between two parties. There is a Hebrew word for covenant, bereth. There's a Greek word, uh, there are two actually, diatik, which is a unilateral, and santik, bilateral. So what they mean by that with diatik is there's two parties in the covenant, but one is giving and one is receiving. So that could be in a will situation. Or santik, bilateral, there's two parties, and they're both giving and receiving. But by definition, covenant actually means to cut a covenant by shedding of blood and walking between two pieces of flesh. So we ask ourselves, I'm just trying to move this out the way because I can't see my headings. There we go. Why blood covenant? Well, we see that from the beginning in Genesis, there was a fall and Romans three tells us for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God knows that the penalty for sin is death. And he doesn't want us to die or perish. He wants us to live and be in relationship with him. So we see that he enters into blood covenants with chosen person or peoples in order to restore that relationship. Remember that the blood covenant is considered the most sacred of all agreements. It is cannot be broken. Now, to cut a covenant ceremony is quite laborious. There's nine steps. There's the robe swapping, belt swapping, cut a covenant, raise the right arm and intermingle your blood, exchange of names, uh, make a scar, covenant terms, memorial meal, and plant a memorial. I won't go into all of those, but each of them had a very symbolic meaning. So the first person we're going to look at is Abraham. God chose to enter into a covenant relationship with Abraham. It's known as the Abrahamic covenant. And we see that in the first book of the Torah, Genesis. Now in Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3, we see that God promises Abraham land, a great nation, and many blessings. God also says to Abram, go and get a ram and go to heifer, get a, a dove and young pigeons and a, a pig, young pigeon. So, of course, Abram goes and by getting these animals, he realizes, oh, he's going to enter into, cut, he's going to cut a covenant with God. And so he goes and he um, splits straight in half, as per the image, the ram, the goat and the heifer. And he stands in the middle of them. That's part of the ceremony. And while he's waiting there, as the ceremony is progressing, birds fly in. And now they're not the dove or the pigeon, they are other birds. And what they're doing is they're coming down to eat and feast on these uh, acceptable sacrifices that God has, has agreed, to, is happy with. And uh, now these birds resemble Satan. So they're actually coming in to destroy this acceptable sacrifice. So Abram thinks, oh, let me help in, in my own strength. Let me help with this. And he shoes the birds away. And God just says, no, no, hold on a minute. You have a sinful nature. Now, by helping with this covenant, you're bringing your sinful nature into the covenant. It's not going to work. I have to do this myself. And you must now go to sleep. So he puts Abram into a very deep sleep. And while Abram is sleeping, he does have this vision where he sees another person standing in the place where he was supposed to be in this covenant ceremony. And he describes this person as a smoking furnace or a burning lamp. Now, if we go to Revelations 1 verse 14 to 15, we realize that that is how Jesus is described. Abram also hears the person saying, I'm dying to myself. I'm giving up the rights to my own life. I'm beginning a new walk with my covenant partner unto death. Now, if we know that human sinful nature, we're not worthy of being in, in right together there with God. The only person who can be before God is someone who is worthy. Who could be worthy? If God is the one covenant partner, then who would possibly be worthy to be the other covenant partner? Well, 
we assume it's Jesus Christ. We say that he stands in the gap right from the beginning. I'm so excited about this because Jesus stands in the gap between Abram and God right at the beginning as part of the Abrahamic covenant. This is an amazing epiphany. And um, so eventually the, the ceremony is finished. Abram wakes up. He now takes on the name. They share names. So H from Yahweh becomes Abraham. You also see the H on Sarah's name. And Abram also then scars himself as a reminder that circumcision is the scar that reminds them of the covenant between God and the Abrahamic covenant. And that's why we see that all the descendants from then on circumcise themselves. It's a reminder of the covenant. Now, um, so with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, we see that the communication genre is historical narrative. It's a factual account and it's written in prose. The next person we speak about is Joshua. Well, as you remember, Joshua is one of the 12 uh, spies who went into the promised land after my, Moses asked them to. He was also the one that was anointed and appointed to lead all the ancient Israelites out of the wilderness. He actually did the circumcision ceremony right by the, once they crossed over Jordan in the promised land. And finally, Joshua, he was a military leader. He was a former prophet. He was the one uh, with God's grace that took them into the promised land and then won many battles as they went through the promised land and um, so Joshua was now coming to the end of his days end of his life but unfortunately what he'd seen over the time of them living in the promised land is that a lot of ancient Israelites had started to worship the foreign gods so the people who lived there before they were still living there and the foreign gods were there so the ancient Israelites were worshiping them so he called them and he called all the ancient Israelites and he said do you remember Egypt do you remember what God did to us for us in the wilderness to remember how he got the promised land and he reminded them of God's goodness and grace and he said for me and my house I'm going to follow the Lord but if you choose to worship your foreign gods it's going to be a disaster and an end for you and luckily praise God the people realized what they were doing and it was wrong and they said yes we choose Yahweh and um, and so Joshua at Shishin then renewed the covenant uh, on behalf of the people which and so the communication genre is historical narrative and thank goodness for that because um the way the Israelites were going, they were going to be doomed. Next up, we see Jeremiah. So we've been to the Torah section of the Bible. Uh, we've seen Joshua, the former prophet. Now we're at the latter prophet section of the Bible, and Jeremiah is there. So in the book of Jeremiah 31, verse 31, we see he says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. Now, the people of ancient Israel at that time probably would have heard him say that and go, okay, cool, there's going to be another covenant. We've got Abram, we've got Moses, we've got David, there's probably just going to be one more person on the list. But us as New Testament believers, we have Captain Hindsight on our side, and we realize that that new covenant is actually Jesus Christ. So he, his genre is prophetic. He is prophesying about Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're going to take a quick look at the development of the covenant theme across the whole of the Old Testament. Obviously, it all began at the very beginning with Adam and Eve because of the sinful nature. Because of our sinful nature, our relationship was severed from God. Hence why the covenant relationships began. Now we see with the Noah covenant with Noah, um, after the flood, 40 days after the flood, uh, God brings out a rainbow which is symbolizing that he will never flood the earth again and also remember that Noah stepped off his ark and the first thing he did is he sacrificed he made a sacrifice to God a blood sacrifice by killing an animal um, next we see that the Abrahamic covenant which we've already spoken about where Abram has promised land blessing descendants but you see because we keep sinning God realized we need structure we need instruction we need help and so he then entered into another covenant relationship with Moses, giving the moral, civil, and ceremonial law. And the moral law is the Ten Commandments. It not only describes who God is, but also how we should try to be. And the civil law is obviously what happens if we don't obey the law. And the ceremonial law is very, very, very complicated. There's the sin offering, trespass offering, which were both mandatory, compulsory. There was the burnt offering, meal offering, peace offering. Now, those were all voluntary. But you can imagine just by seeing all of that how complicated it was. The, the, to, 
to keep within the covenant relationship was complicated. There were a lot of things you had to do. In fact, God chose Aaron, who is a Levite, to be the high priest, and then all his descendants would be priests or high priests, depending on the situation as, as the time went. Um, and they actually represented humankind and ran the tabernacle. So they knew, you know, they were very au fait with all the offerings and, and they took care of the tabernacle. And in fact, the high priest was the only one who was allowed into the Holy of Holies before God, who sat on the mercy seat. And finally, again, we see the Davidic covenant. Now, this is interesting where David, it's similar to the Abrahamic covenant. He's offered land, he's offered descendants and blessings. But on top of that, we see that the prophet Nathan says um, you you will rule forever and your descendants will rule forever which is incredible because that is speaking of the new covenant because Jesus Christ is a descendant of David so it all points to Jesus Christ okay so now that we've understood the development of how the covenant goes throughout the Old Testament it also now will help us understand the overall story of the Testament. God's love for us is eternal. We see that in Psalm 117. And because of our sinful nature, we're severed. Our relationship with God is severed. But he never gives up on us. And as it says throughout the old, the whole story of the Old Testament, it's that continual entering of blood covenant relationships to renew, restore the relationship so that we aren't doomed. And it happens again and again and again and again. And that is truly the thread that runs through the Old Testament, bringing us into the New Testament. We have to understand something really important, that no matter how many sacrifices they made, sin was never taken away. It was only ever covered. So that's why they had to keep going back. The priests worked day and night, year after year, and they'd still be doing it today if it hadn't have been for the new covenant that's about to take place. And so God realized that we need a savior and that only he could take away the sins of the world. Humans will never, ever be able to do that. And so the question now we have to ask ourselves is who can stand in for humankind? In other words, can represent us as fully human, but yet also be worthy to stand before God, as we saw in the very beginning in the Abrahamic covenant. And so here comes Jesus. Jesus Christ is born. God gives his one and only son to us. He's born and he becomes fully human, but at the same time, he's fully God. And because of this amazingness, um, he can now represent us before God and he can be the worthy sacrifice. So ultimately, the overall story of the Old Testament is the Old Testament is revealing to us and pointing us to the coming Savior, Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, so just to conclude, we know that the new blood covenant is Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment of all the previous covenants. He is now the Lamb of God. He is the one who came and takes away the sin of the world forever. It is taken. It is done. That's what he says on the cross. It is done. There is no more sin because of what Jesus has done for us. And so Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, as we see in Ephesians 2, verse 14 to 16. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He actually says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So it's at this point that we understand that Jesus is the one final sacrifice. And in order for us to be in relationship with God, uh, we need to accept Jesus into our heart and, and accept that he is our savior and he did this for us. And then we need to repent. And then we ask the Holy Spirit to dwell in us and we're born again. And the blessing of that is eternal life. And so we now become God's new temple. The covenant because of this is so much simplified. It, we don't have to make blood sacrifices, praise God, anymore. We look to Jesus, accept who he is, accept what he's done for us, and accept, uh, ask for the Holy Spirit to enter our lives. What's left with us after all this is we don't have to, as I mentioned, do the ceremonial law or civil law, but what law still remains is the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Again, remember that that's actually showing us who God is and who God wants us to be. He knows that we'll never be able to actually uh, keep those Ten Commandments because of our sinful nature. But 
through Jesus Christ, we can be redeemed and saved. And so the greatest commandment of these 10 commandments is love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength. So us who are here now and for our future generations, that's what we're called to do, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind and all our strength. And I would like to encourage each and every one of us as we move forward, if you haven't given your life to the Lord yet, do that, consider it, pray to God and ask him to enter your life. But if you have been born again and you've taken on the name as Christian, just as before when you take on the name, you've taken the name as Christian, well then meditate on God's word daily, pray for the continual inflow, infilling of the Holy Spirit daily, give God a glory to God in every season. And what we are called to do, we must try and go out and do is reach out to the lost and share the good news. The end.